The revolution is lit. Uhuru, comrades, welcome to today's Amali Taught Me Sunday study featuring Chairman Amali Ishitella. I am your MC, Akilia Nayi, the Director of Agitation and Propaganda for the African People's Socialist Party. These studies are so important and we encourage you right now to invite your friends and family to it, like and share the video, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. This week, Chairman Amalia Shatella continues reading from the political report to the African People's Socialist Party's 2021 plenary titled African Workers of the World Unite and Organize. He continues in chapter two, starting at the subhead, the crisis is not cyclical, it's permanent. And you can find those study materials in the Facebook and YouTube descriptions. For the first hour, the chairman will review the study materials. And in the second hour, we'll open it up to you, our live viewers, to ask your questions. So it is my honor now to introduce our leadership, the leader of the African nation and the worldwide African revolution, Chairman Amali Shatello. Uhuru Chairman. Uhuru, comrade. Thank you so much, Director Akile, uh, for the introduction. And I just want to express my appreciation uh, to you uh, for all the work that you do uh, with uh, the Department of Agitation and Propaganda that includes uh, uh, producing uh, this discussion that we're having on today. <clears throat> I was uh, saying uh, earlier before, uh, before beginning, uh, something I'm sure that everybody notices every time that, uh, uh, that you're one of those artists who every time you show up, we never know exactly what you're going to look like or who you're going to be. And uh, uh, it's extraordinary. So, so you make it easy to, to participate in this discussion. I'm sure that uh, our membership uh, and audience embrace you uh, in the same way. So thank you, uh, uh, comrade, and uh, for uh, the introduction and for all of the work that you do. I want to say uh, before uh, getting uh, into the study that, um, uh, uh, that our party lost a really uh, important uh, comrade, uh, um, a, co a comrade Kwame out of San Diego, uh, who uh, was somebody uh, that was an organizer and worked with the party for uh, <clears throat> a very long time. And, uh, and one of the persons who uh, was with us early on uh, in uh, the work to uh, build our presence uh, in, in San Diego. And uh, he passed recently, not too long ago. And I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Comrade Twa uh, Kwame. Uh, he worked very closely with Union de Barrio. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes in, uh, he was uh, like, uh, he represented the physical uh, relationship between Union de Barrio uh, and the African People Socialist Party. And uh, to some extent, we can say that he represented a uh, kind of relationship between 
uh, colonized Africans uh, uh, in the U.S. and the uh, colonized uh, Mexican population. So, so I want to extend uh, uh, our condolences uh, to Comrade uh, Kwame's comrades and uh, to his family uh, as well, and all of you who worked with that comrade uh, in San Diego and other places. Com Kwame uh, lived for a while uh, in, in Mexico, uh, right across the border, the illegitimate border uh, that had, had been established uh, uh, between uh, Mexico proper and occupied Mexico, which is, is California. So I, I just really wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge that comrade. Also, uh, I know that uh, occasionally, on at least two occasions, I think I've, I've worn uh, a shirt, uh, uh, a black shirt with a big red star on it. And uh, comrades, uh, in particular, comrade um, Nasir uh, out of Kuwait has uh, inquired where I got the shirt. And I've really, uh, comrade Nasir, I've tried to make it possible for that shirt to be, uh, to be made available uh, to you. But the comrade um, who, uh, who, who I bought the shirt from, uh, I think indicated that for some reason it was going to take some time before he could uh, he could make the shirt uh, available otherwise. So I'm hoping that, um, I'm hoping that uh, by now, I, I think this comrade is, is, is probably in the study today and that uh, if possible, he should uh, say something uh, in the comment section, uh, et cetera, about how that shirt can be acquired. So uh, I wanted to make, you know, just those two observations uh, early on. And then finally, uh, what I wanted to say is, uh, something about the significance of what it is that we are doing with the political report and, and the party uh, overall. And uh, uh, because we are engaged in a very serious struggle and uh, the party has developed a genuinely uh, revolutionary uh, theory. Our, our movement has suffered for a very long time uh, in the area, area of theory and uh, which has reduced us uh, often to uh, uh, name calling as a substitute for, uh, for theory and, and for analysis. And uh, we've come up with some pretty good names uh, for white people, uh, et cetera, that really have no, do not explain to us, provide no explanation of, uh, <laughs> to us of uh, what our, what our, what, what our why we are in this situation we're in and how to get out of it. No real explanation. Uh, most of it is superstitious or, or, or something uh, to that effect. And I think that the party, uh, this political report that we're talking about uh, contributes to our ability to have a, a, a more meaningful a kind of discussion that helps to educate uh, certainly the members of our party to allow us to become uh, the the revolutionary evangelist to take revolutionary theory, uh, not just in terms of some kinds of forums that we'll be uh, conducting, but into actual practical work uh, among the masses to help uh, uh, change the lives of our people and help uh, the people uh, to become uh, uh, their own champions and uh, responsible for uh, participating in our own uh, revolutionary emancipation. So. I mean, that's, that's, that's been a weakness and that's what the party has, has taken on. And that's what uh, this discussion, this study is about essentially as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's to arm you, members of the party, members of the Uhuru movement, uh, to give you uh, the wherewithal uh, to take uh, this struggle, our struggle uh, to the people, to help the people um, uh, become uh, the real architects of, uh, of the future, conscious architect, architects of the future uh, that we are in the process of constructing. So uh, I'm looking now, uh, while, uh, while uh, uh, initiating this kind of introduction uh, for um, a, a better way to, uh, to uh, to read uh, the report that I have before me. I wanna say I was talking uh, earlier with comrade uh, uh, director uh, Akili Anai and uh, before that earlier this morning. 
uh, with the deputy chair of the party, uh, who is also uh, my wife and partner in so many other ways, uh, about uh, the, the despicable, uh, slimy, uh, vermin, uh, the African neo-colonial petty bourgeoisie. And uh, because uh, the fact is that they facilitate uh, all of the, uh, the attacks on our community and they facilitate the rule of foreign hostile alien uh, 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 forces that we uh, recognize as colonizers without their help, without uh, uh, the role that they play, uh, it would be very difficult uh, for the imperialists to control our lives. And, and often uh, we hear from our communities uh, things like, that we just all have to get along together. That comes when, 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 the, when the masses try to rise up and identify uh, the role that these slimy vermin play. And then every city, every country where African people are located, they help to facilitate our oppression. Uh, and sometimes they get elected into office, they've been put there and by the rulers. And then sometimes accidentally we see forces who do uh, uh, seem to uh, make it through that process and become leaders like people like Lumumba, they murder him, people like Nkrumah. Uh, they slander and then uh, they overthrow them and then ultimately murder them. People like Tomas Sankara uh, being uh, some examples of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, but the system is set up to facilitate uh, uh, these, these, uh, this, this colonial domination of Africans and peoples of the world. And generally speaking, operating within the system are those uh, forces who uh, uh, are there to facilitate the domination of our people. That's why we're doing this discussion because we have to get beyond uh, just simple uh, um, analysis that uh, presupposes again that we're all you know, on the same side and there's just this misunderstanding and white people just don't like us and we have to really teach them something about who we are so that they can, they can, you know, uh, they can really learn to like us. And we have to teach them things about love because they just don't understand that. Other kinds of simple things that we hear. We, we have to bring science to this discussion. And that's what we talk about with, the, with this political report with the African People's Socialist Party, because we fought for so many years to introduce a level of science uh, that is a science of society that can be understood. The masses of our people can understand this. And certainly those who are in the party, who are the advanced attachment of those masses, who, who represent the general staff uh, of the people, uh, we must and can understand this. And, and, and through the work that we do, uh, bring this understanding to the people in the process of winning this liberation. We must believe this. That this has never really happened in the world in a very effective way. People have talked about it in the past, about the working class you know, it has to lead this and it has to lead that. And they fought in the name of the working class. But most often, uh, these have been movements led by uh, petty bourgeois intellectuals, et cetera, who uh, uh, sometimes have been able to bring uh, workers uh, into uh, the project. But we have historically begun uh, a foundation being among the workings, the most oppressed sectors of the population. And uh, what we are about is uh, we deny uh, the lie that's told by the petty bourgeoisie when they're trying to tell us how we can't uh, talk about colonialism and socialism and communism and things like that. Uh, well, one thing, because the people won't like us if we say that. And the second thing is because even though this is how they put it, even though I understand the masses can understand it, like, like, which is nonsense. Of course, the people can understand it. And, uh, and the people, if, if I can understand it, then the masses can understand it. I am of the masses. I am of the working class. And, and uh, there are others uh, out there. And if they are not directly from the working class, if they are not directly from the working class, they're only a few seconds away from it because the truth of the matter is that all of us were brought into this colonial enterprise, this capitalist uh, system uh, as enslaved human beings uh, whose labor built the, the entire social system. So all of us can understand this. And, and uh, uh, there are sectors of us who I mentioned earlier have been given a stake in the system of our oppression and exploitation. Uh, that's how the whole class question has been introduced uh, into our community uh, uh, to our detriment. But uh, the advanced attachment, those of us who are in the party, those of us who recognize that in order to get out of this, we're gonna to have to have a revolution. In order to have a revolution, we're gonna to have to have a revolutionary party. 
in order to have a revolutionary party that can result in revolution, we're gonna to have to have advanced revolutionary theory. And that revolutionary, advanced revolutionary theory is African internationalism. And that, even though we use some of the same terms that people use when they talk about socialism, even though we use some of the same terms that people use when they talk about Marxism, we are not uh, the, the Marxists that they're talking, we are African internationalists. And there's a difference. Uh, because uh, despite uh, the wonderful work that Marx may have done, uh, the advanced ideas he may have had, uh, Marx uh, practically uh, was, uh, uh, was a, 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 a left colonizer. He was a, a progressive colonizer to say that, and, and, and this is not a statement of, of his, his intentions, it's a statement of an objective reality. And that objective reality of him being located on top of the pedestal of our oppression and every information, all the, uh, the his understanding uh, was influenced by that reality, informed by that reality, which means that what he was able to see uh, was limited and was uh, predetermined by his relationship to the system itself on top of our oppression. The African uh, uh, workers and impressed people and Africans in general, we have to become uh, the subjects of history. When Marx defined us, we were objects of history as he defined it. Now we have a responsibility. We've always had a responsibility to define our reality for ourselves. This is part of what this is about. This is not just some empty uh, discussion, you know, uh, uh, of academia, uh, something to that effect. In fact, I, I, I really detest most of the so-called intellectuals who we come into contact with because of the, usually the petty bourgeoisie. Also, I wanted to say in terms of like this, this, this despicable neo-colonial forces, like uh, we engaged uh, uh, in, in the African People's Socialist Party in a really important uh, uh, revolutionary project. We don't usually think about, people don't usually think about uh, the electoral process being a revolutionary uh, uh, project. And generally speaking, it is not. Generally speaking, the electoral process is something that is established to maintain the cont continuity of the social system. It provides a safe place uh, for, for struggles to happen between contending sectors of the rulers for, for the continuing maintenance and, uh, and, 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 and development uh, of the system of colonialism. But the colonized people now, Africans, uh, have fought our way uh, into the ability to have a discussion. And uh, uh, as opposed to those neo-colonial forces who were put there, uh, 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 and I say they were put there because when they killed Malcolm, when they killed King, when they destroyed the Panther Party, when they attacked uh, Jomo and the revolutionary the revolution of the 60s, uh, they made sure that we would not be the dominant voices uh, representing the interests of African people and that this slimy sector that they projected, some of whom may have come from the civil rights movement, uh, that they make sure that there is th these are the ones uh, who operate within the context of the electoral process. So the people never get a, <clears throat> an opportunity to hear their own voices and to hear their own interests. Now they've destroyed the revolutionary organizations. They've assassinated revolutionary and radical leaders who would take us to another place. Uh, and then they have left the African petty bourgeoisie there in the electoral process as a part of an overall counterinsurgency uh, to keep the interests of the masses of our people from political expressions in the world by any means at all. So now uh, uh, we engage in this and struggle in, 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 in St. Louis, which is a really remarkable place because it is the center of uh, much of uh, how uh, the, the architecture of, uh, <clears throat> of African colonization uh, looks inside the United States. It, it is uh, much of what we know about housing laws and patterns and segregation and uh, expropriating uh, value <clears throat> from our communities, the destruction of communities, uh, to actually uh, using the Afri colonized African communities as a certain sort of a resource bank that's available not only for the white ruling class, but sectors of the colonizers who might otherwise be considered uh, upper working class or the petty bourgeoisie. Uh, this is what, what our communities function as. This is why you see ordinary white people in their pickup trucks and clipboards riding through our communities, taking down addresses and stuff like that. They are in the process of what they call gentrifying, or which is nothing but population removal uh, to provide economic resources and relief for white people when, when the crisis of, of, the, of the system uh, achieves a certain uh, level. Or uh, as in St. Louis, or what we have, it's been set like that all the time. And so uh, it's just an overall 
process that they've created, even having zoning laws that while they can't uh, legally say that this is for white people only, et cetera, they've made zoning laws so that uh, uh, single uh, uh, member housing, uh, single family housing have to occupy this huge lot that most Africans cannot afford. And then multi-family uh, uh, dwellings, et cetera, uh, 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 are located in, in particular places that this uh, helps to move people where they want them to be at any given time. Uh, and Africans live in these places until uh, white power, white people need it. And then they go ahead through using laws and the, and the, and the, and the, uh, uh, the electoral process, uh, making other kinds of determinations. And then what they do uh, in, in the United States, and they do specifically in St. Louis, like they do around the rest of the world, they use these Africans who are colonized, colonized people like us. Uh, they allow them to be elevated into these uh, 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 places of, uh, of government, et cetera. And then they become the indirect tool. They become the tool through which white power uh, operates in our community indirectly. So the white man doesn't have to come there in his own face. Now he's got these Negroes who would do things, set up things uh, uh, for them. Uh, and that's what we're running into. St. Louis is a remarkable example of that because it's the headquarters, it's much of what we experienced throughout the world, uh, the country, in the United States in particular, uh, the architecture for that was uh, was in St. Louis and continues to be there today. So we've got, we're running these incredibly significant campaigns from the African working class uh, that's taking this thing up and uh, just getting great examples of how the rulers do not want people to participate in the electoral process. They create the system. system. They push the African people out of political life and then they criticize Africans for, for not, for being apathetic. You don't, you don't vote, you don't register the vote and things like that. When the fact of the matter is they kill all the revolutionaries. They making sure that nothing can get on the, on the platform. Nothing gets on the electoral agenda that represents the interests of the masses and masses that have no basis, no reason to come. And they've been betrayed so many times by sellout Negroes, they just don't show up. But it's not anything wrong with the people. There's something wrong with the system. And there's something wrong with those people who they put there in place and those people who learn how to sing the right songs in order to stay there, in order to be in place, in order to sell themselves to the capitalists and in the process of doing that, sell our communities to the colonial capitalists. And that's what we're up against in St. Louis. And so part of what we've seen is these Negroes are filing suits, they cynical suits, they're frivolous suits uh, in, to try to keep us off the ballot. Uh, so that the people don't have an opportunity to make a choice between us. Uh, uh, when I say us, I'm talking about Africans who have a political program. I'm talking about African internationalists who bring a genuine revolutionary analysis, concrete science to this process to remove us from this place of simply identifying who is gonna be supported uh, for office because their, grand, their granddaddy was there for 40 years or because uh, 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 I like this person or, or uh, because they spoke to me last Thursday at the church because they sent, uh, uh, when my grandmother died, uh, we, they passed a resolution. They got a resolution uh, uh, that was sent to, uh, to the funeral to make sure to keep their name out in front of the people. This is the kind of nonsense that we've been trapped with. That's what we're up against now. And it's an incredibly significant and powerful uh, electoral process. And I want you to keep your eye on this. Party members, Uhuru members, and others, just like any other political work that we do, this is not about simply an election in St. Louis. This is about an overall comprehensive approach that this that is represented in the political report that I'm reading from now, a comprehensive political uh, 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 approach uh, to uh, attack, uh, fight, against colonial domination of our people. And this is just one front that we are engaged in. And this is something that helps to raise the contradictions up so that the people can see better what the hell is going on so that African petty bourgeoisie does not have a monopoly on this electoral space, this space, this political space that we not intruded. And we intend to have the interests of the African working class and poor people and the African people in general to really be represented here despite the fact that it's a rigged game in the sense that the Democratic Party is a part of the whole apparatus that works against us most of the time. So this is where we are. And I want people to look uh, at our candidates, uh, uh, Herdosia uh, Kalambayi uh, Bintam uh, and Tashawa Masimba. And you can go to uh, uh, Kalambayi, K-A-L-A-M-B-A-Y-I, vote Kalambayi, K-A-L-A-M-B-A-Y-I, 
www.vote.org, uh, Masimba, uh, Vote uh, T'Challa, um, uh, Masimba, M-A-S-I-M-B-A.org, and, and, and see what you can do uh, to support this, just as you would support any other meaningful uh, kind of campaign that's being waged uh, uh, by our people. Uh, because this is, these are campaigns that are talking about reparations, talking about community control of the police, community control of education, talking about all those kinds of projects, talking about independent economic development for our communities, talking about all those kinds of projects that nullify or negate uh, the colonial power uh, to the extent we can within the territories that we occupy. I just wanted to say those things. So I know that's a long uh, sort of uh, presentation in terms of an overview, but I think it's really important. So, and I despise these guys because these guys, they work. They, these are not dummies. You know, sometimes you, you know, you have uh, 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 people who really uh, don't understand the question and do uh, stuff, uh, uh, stuff that works against the people because of inexperience or because of ignorance and things like that. And, you know, people have been tricked a lot of times because we denied uh, education, denied uh, within, the, within the, the system. Sometimes you're worse off when you do get the education, um, which is a function of, which is a form of miseducation as somebody once characterized it. Uh, but the, 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 the fact is that, uh, that uh, this is the reality that we can understand, that we have to change, that we have to take on. So uh, I'm going now to uh, the political report. And, uh, 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 and where I am is uh, on page 28 uh, with the subtitle, The Crisis is Not Cyclical, It is Permanent. And we're talking about uh, the crisis of this this system, uh, and it's, a, it's something that's very obvious. You know, you know, I didn't make it up uh, uh, because uh, you you've seen uh, uh, you know white people scaling the walls, attacking the Capitol. You've seen uh, uh, various other manifestations of crisis that even in, include the campaign, the election of Trump, the excitement of a sector of the white population for Bernie Sanders. The, everything that's going against the, uh, uh, the grain of the normal political process is occurring here. And, uh, uh, you know, it took like 30,000 troops, five times more troops uh, uh, to, than what are in Afghanistan and, 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 and in uh, Iraq. You had that five times more troops to be able uh, to secure the capital of the United States now, for the so-called uh, transfer of power, you certainly can't call it peaceful transfer of power if you had that those kinds of arms out there. So, uh, on page 28, the crisis is not cyclical; it is permanent. As we quoted from the article by Cooley and Nick Nixon earlier, the crisis is not cyclical; it is permanent. Uh, I, I, I'm uh, trying to; I'm not being quite successful in in using, uh, using the system that I'm trying to work from here to read these pages. Um, uh, so we say, um, as we quoted from the article by Cooley and Nixon earlier, the crisis is not cyclical, it is permanent. We have reached the extreme extremity of uh, US decline. We have reached the extremity of, uh, of US decline as the defining colonial capitalist power in the world. The class and national polarization revealed by the 2016 US presidential election have always been present. The US success in murdering, slandering, and imprisoning millions of African people along with other aspects of counterinsurgency and assassination and imprison our leaders, uh, pump debilitating drugs into our community as a life and morale destroying economic vacuum, sucking billions of dollars from our colonized community to be pumped into the bellies, fridges, and bank accounts of the colonizers, cloak the true nature of the system to the world, including the colonizers and the colonized. I want to say that again, because I was really clumsy in how I read that, I'm retreated uh, to a uh, hard copy. Uh, so we say that the US success in murdering, murdering, slandering, and imprisoning millions of African people, along with other aspects of counterinsurgency that assassinated and imprisoned 
Our leaders pump debilitating drugs into our community as a life and morale destroying economic vacuum, sucking billions of dollars from our colonized community to be pumped into the bellies, fridges, and bank accounts of the colonizers, cloak the true nature of the system to the world, including the colonizers and the colonized. Now, the proverbial chickens have come home to roost and the built-in contradictions of a world and worldview resting on a foundation of colonial capitalist oppression are proving more devastating than the improvised explosive devices or IEDs uh, that bedevil US military colonial occupiers in the Middle East. The crisis of the colonial capitalist system represents the rot and decay of global parasitism uh, and it is explosive inside the US. The lives of ordinary colonizers, just plain white folks, will never be the same again. Economic crisis will continue essentially unabated. The anti-colonial work of our party is only one of the factors that guarantees this. People, peoples the world over must, as a condition for continued existence, fight to regain control of our ability to produce life for ourselves. Whether in Afghanistan, Venezuela, or North St. Louis, Missouri, in the US, in all the Americas, including indigenous peoples and on the entire continent of Africa, and wherever we are located, the African nation is being made increasingly aware of the relationship of our forced dispersal and the conditions in which we find ourselves wherever we are located. These contradictions are the basis of the inevitability of unending struggle. They are the basis of the current uneasy equilibrium that is tilting every day in favor of the future, in favor of the destruction of the colonial capitalist social system, the liberation and unification of Africa and the advent of socialism on a global scale. The global contest between the colonized and the colonizer is sharpening within the US Millions of white people, colonizers, are politically mobilized around a naked, non-pretentious, uncamouflaged, pro-colonialist worldview. It is a worldview that has its basis in an objective relationship that exists between the colonizers, whose well-being and future are predicated on the merciless deprivation of life and well-being of Africans. I want to say that again because it's really important for us to understand this, that the global contest between the colonized and the colonizer is sharpening within the US. Millions of white people, colonizers, are politically mobilized around a naked, non-pretentious, uncamouflaged, uncamouflaged, pro-colonialist worldview. It is a worldview that has its basis in an objective relationship that exists between the colonizers whose well-being and future are predicated on the merciless deprivation of life and well-being for Africans. We say that it is a worldview that has its basis in an objective relationship. We say objective as distinct from subjective. Objective relationship means ob what is objective is what is in the world. What is subjective is, is what is in your head. So uh, it, it depends on whether or not what's in your head uh, uh, somehow is accurately relating uh, what's in the world, whether or not you have a subjective or an objective approach to anything. And what we're saying is that there is an objective reality uh, that to which uh, this worldview that white people have comes from. It's not something that they, they went into a, a, a room and discovered on their own. It's not even something that some uh, white leaders like Donald Trump or uh, et cetera, just told them this stuff and they carried out. There's an objective relationship. There's a material relationship that exists in the world between white people, the colonizers, and Africans who are colonized. And the worldview that the white people have, the colonizers have, is a worldview that is a reflection of this objective reality. It has its origin in this objective reality. Unfortunately, what happens is that the this worldview is something that informs African people who uh, usually and uh, most often do not have a worldview that stems from our understanding, our recognition that has been scientifically provided to us uh, by uh, the African People's Socialist Party. So we say that the contradictions of US settler colonialism have been thrust to the surface by the permanent fight 
of the indigenous people against ongoing encroachment on the paltry land and other resources left by settler colonialism under their nominal authority. The ludicrous fight over immigrant rights, so-called immigrant rights, is also connected to land theft of over half of Mexico and neo-colonial and other imperialist policies and relationships being contested throughout the Americas. And many colonized Mexicans correctly proclaim, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. And I think that's really important and scientific uh, statement that's being made here. Uh, uh, because here you've got people who have been declared uh, illegal and, and immigrants. And who makes that declare, declaration? I mean, it's like the thief defining what, what, what theft is. And, and so you have a situation where the white people come here from Europe, from other places, and steal the land uh, from the indigenous people. And sometimes you hear today when people try to cover up this crime that they say stuff like, we are all immigrants. Hell, we're not all immigrants. Uh, the indigenous people are not immigrants here. Uh, and Africans are not immigrants. Africans came here as captives, not as some kind of immigrants. And the colonizer came here not as immigrants, but as invaders. And so this is the real relationship that we are talking about and that we have a responsibility to uh, expose. And the, the, so the Mexicans say correctly, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. They stole half of Mexico at gunpoint. Uh, the strategic location of domestically, and it's not just a matter of they did some naughty thing once upon a time, and let's, maybe we can all forget it and they can apologize. No, no, they stole half of Mexico and the conditions of the Mexican people, both in what they call Mexico and what they call California and what they call Texas and what they call Colorado and what they call Arizona and what they call Utah and various other places, the conditions of the people there uh, 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 are consequential. They are a response to the fact that this land resources stolen and the murder and mayhem they had to commit against the people in order to do that. Not to speak of the indigenous people of, uh, of the Americas uh, who are referred to as so-called Indians. Uh, who don't even get mentioned um, most of the time, who are living in concentration camps, naked concentration camps, uh, called uh, Indian uh, reservations. This is the reality that we are dealing with. It's not some makeup, some fanciful notion that you know, people like Biden and Kamala Harris and others would impress upon us that, that, that all of the, that we're just getting along better together now because we got, uh, we got a cabinet by Biden that looks like America. Hell, America has always, uh, 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 which is an invention that came about as a consequence of stealing this land, stealing my peoples uh, 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 and other oppressed peoples around the world. It's always been like that. So to say that uh, this looks more like America's look, uh, slave ship looked a lot like America, but except you had, because uh, you hear all, often uh, 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 white people will say, say, well, we all in this together. Hell, we were in this together. We were in the same boat uh, when we came here, uh, except uh, we were down in those slave holes who are dying of, of all kinds of disease and what have you, and you were up on top, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, responsible for getting us uh, to uh, to the Americas and other places where we will be exploited. Uh, so the fact that that uh, it looks like America is isn't saying something very profound. It's just saying that uh, neo-colonialism uh, works more effectively. It's saying that there's a sector of the rulers of uh, not just of America. Uh, but this has been a debate that's gone on within the so-called imperialist uh, sectors for a while among the colonizers. The best, most effective way in order to control the colonized. A man named Frederick Lugard, uh, who uh, is the one who invented what they call Nigeria, uh, uh, was the one who perfected this thing called indirect rule that we refer to as, as neo-colonialism, new colonialism. It doesn't mean colonialism went away, a neo-colonialism that employs sectors of the African population, sectors of the, of the colonized people uh, to participate uh, in uh, the, uh, the, the, the control of the rest of us. And they re it rewards them for doing that. So we say uh, 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 six years. Uh, and we say this, the, the strategic uh, location of domestically colonized Africans in the US has been a powerful impetus uh, for the crisis of imperialism that is being experienced by ordinary colonizers, especially from lower and so-called middle-class citizens of the settler colonial state. Six years after the seminal August 9, 2014 uprising of Africans in St. Louis, Ferguson, Missouri, the May 25th, 2020 African rebellions uh, sparked by the brutal murder 
of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, unleashed a protest and uprising unprecedented in US history, pushing people of all nationalities in the US to spontaneous open opposition to US domestic policies and tradition. The reawakening of the African giant that had previously been beaten and jailed into a presumed state of unorganized stupor has shattered the facade of social peace that has enveloped US society since the general defeat of the Black Revolution of the 60s. Comrades, it is our party that has successfully assumed responsibility at the helm of this reawakened movement. It is we who represent the will and direction of the struggle of African workers of the world to unite and organize for the long overdue conquest of power and unification that is called for by this plenary. We must win. We are winning. I'm messing with this process a little. I hope y'all have some patience with me. Uh, this uh, COVID thing has uh, uh, removed me from close proximity with people uh, in, in my office. And so, uh, um, so here I am, I'm almost back where I need to be, bravo. Almost back where I need to be, comrades. There's somebody out there taking responsibility for that. I'm not going to make a joke <laughs> about that. But come back, come by, you know my jokes. You know what I'm thinking. So uh, here's where we are. We, uh, we, uh, we have approached chapter three. And here uh, we are talking about uh, the title of this is chapter is Africa and the African Socialist International. We are everywhere. African people and our vanguard party. African internationalism is a theory of practice requiring the active intervention in life. The cumulative uh, activity of our party globally is having a profound effect on our struggle for the liberation and unification of Africa and African people under the leadership of the party. The advanced detachment of our colonized nation and brutally oppressed indefatigable working class. The solidity of the African nation is being won and led through the political work of our party globally. This is actively exacerbating the instability, general crisis and decline of the colonial capitalist social system. Africa was crucial to the emergence of the colonial capitalist system and is necessary for its ongoing capacity. While more and more predators are being drawn into the life extracting economic fray fighting to continue bleeding the colonized, the growing influence of the African People's Socialist Party continues to deepen the imperialist crisis. Clearly, we are winning. The African Socialist International is on the ground in Africa. The work of Secretary General Louisa Kinshasa is rapidly pushing this process forward. After many years of struggle and ups and downs, it is impossible to say too much about the steady and patient leadership that Comrade Louisa has provided for the development of the ASI, the African Socialist International, with work throughout Europe and the continent of Africa itself. The significance of our foothold in occupied Azania or South Africa as it is known by its colonial name cannot be exaggerated. Ruling class media do not report on our work because they created the conventional perception that all events will be measured by the electoral process established by the white colonizers. For them, like most global observers, it is the sometimes militant activism that flares up within the neo-colonial capitalist state electoral system that is critical, that is the critical determinant factor. A party has always recognized that African people organized under the independent leadership of the advanced detachment of the working class will decide the future of our people and nation, not the neo-colonial capitalist democratic electoral system. This distinguishes our party from the first president of independent Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah, who made an error in assuming that the liberation and unification of Africa and our nation could be achieved by agreement of, of between neo-colonial heads of state whose economic and political relevance depended on upholding the colonial capitalist social system. This is why we are African internationalists. 
uh, and not Pan-Africanists. We recognize that our Africa will be liberated and united through the informed, independent expression of our collective will by the masses of African people under the revolutionary leadership of our party. It is the only way. Our work in Occupied Zania therefore has added significance because it is the launch pad of our regional work on the entire African continent. Our party has had a presence on the African continent for a long time. Among other places, we have done organizing work uh, in Sierra Leone, Ghana, Kenya, Namibia, and in South Africa going back many years. However, it has been the most recent period that we have established the party and our unadulterated African international's worldview on the ground with the presence of the African People's Socialist Party occupied Zania. We are in the townships, out of the view of most ruling class and liberal media. Our party is in various townships through our mass organizations. We are spreading advanced revolutionary theory among the most dispossessed sectors of the African population. NPDM, ANWO, and APDEP are all there, existing and organizing with varying, varying degrees of efficacy and stability. We are there among the masses of our people who our theory teaches us are central to making the revolutionary struggle for power in the hands of the African working class. We are not to be confused with trade unionism, which at best limits the struggle of the workers to accomplish better deals at the point of production. Never mind the fact that the so-called point of production is located on the pedestal of African colonialism and requires the extraction of our human and material resources for its success. In contrast, African internationalism educates and organizes the African working class to take power, to become the new ruling class, which is the definition of socialism properly understood. In addition, value, uh, in, in addition of value of our party's work in Occupy the Zani is the role dele delegated to our South African party chairman, Tafari Mugheri, to build and lead the party's work throughout Africa, where our presence is rapidly expanded. Uh, sometimes this results in the creation of party members and organizations in various locations. Sometimes we have only held members for a short period of time. But in every instance, the method of our recruitment process has resulted in sowing the fertile seeds of African internationalism and in introducing to the consciousness of African, Africans everywhere that our party is here. We are now in Chad, Nigeria, Mali, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, Ivory Coast, Ghana, Sierra Leone, South Africa, and other places with greater or lesser degrees of effectiveness. The magnitude of the party's organized presence in occupied Zania is expressed in its successful function as the hub for our Africa work. The work we do in Africa now has the benefit of on the ground organization and leadership that assumes responsibility for success. The formal declaration of our party to build the African Socialist International occurred 40 years ago at the first Congress of the African People's Socialist Party in September 1981. This was the bold move that helped to separate the party from Pan-African and other pro-independence organizations within the US and globally. The political and ideological struggle surrounding our ASI work was part of the process of forging the party as the advanced attachment, the custodian of the international African liberation movement. This was also part of the process of fighting to provide a revolutionary theory for the struggle of our people. It represented the understanding of the party that philosophical coherence and ideological clarity were urgently necessary to liberate Africa and our people globally. It is this process of ideological and political struggle that continues to be essential to our national liberation and the advent of the socialist world led by the workers in arms. Our ASI work gives a concrete reality to our African internationalist theory and is the only reason it is possible to speak of an African liberation movement as distinct from the inherently opportunistic work of the Pan-Africans and others. Initially, we scurried the earth looking for African revolutionary organizations that would join with us to create the ASI. Through the years, we were forced to conclude that our regular organizing trips through Europe and Africa were going up against the dregs of international African opportunism. We saw that we, the African People's Socialist Party, would have to assume full responsibility for building the revolutionary party of the African working class globally, or as Marcus Garvey might have said, universally. One contradiction we have encountered throughout all our revolutionary work is so obvious we have given too little attention to it. That contradiction rests in theory. We have always struggled against all underlying presumptions of social reality 
with no actual real foundation in life. The fact is that Africa and Africans are the primary basis for the existing social system. We are not just some pitiful people who are horribly treated in society. We are the very foundation of the society that we criticize. Capitalism has its origin in colonial slavery. The comparative genius attributed to Europe or the so-called civilized or superior white man is a fallacy, an assumption born of colonial slavery. The prevailing global assumption of so-called white supremacy, though not always expressed directly, stems logically from a global superstructure of ideas and legal systems originating from the global capitalist economic base of society formed on colonialism. As African internationalists, we are absolutely confident that African and Africans are key to the destruction of the capitalist parasite. There is no shortcut. African revolution under the leadership of the African working class is the way forward. This is the revolution that is struggling for expression everywhere Africans are located in the world, notwithstanding their consciousness of this fact, or to say it another way, independent of their will. Our party is the only vehicle for forging an international African consciousness and the revolutionary organization to provide this consciousness in concrete form. This is African internationalism and the African Socialist International. Only we are doing this. This is why we always mean something different than black militants and left-wing colonizers when addressing the issues of Africa and African people, the colonizers of the world and the world of the colonizers. ASI launched in 1982. We are the whirlwind. Our first formal initiative to build the ASI occurred on November 15, 1982. The day following our historic world, first world tribunal on reparations for African people in the US. Among others present were representatives from Barbados, Senegal, Congo, and South Africa. For a while, there was some limited work by the various forces committed to building the ASI. For example, we were alerted to the pending October 25th, 1983 US invasion of Grenada by comrades in Barbados, one of the US staging grounds. But it will be some years later that the party would solidify the ASI organization. There continues to be some hiccups in this work to build the party internationally. Africans from a number of countries in Europe and Africa have been in and out of the process, but we do have a process. Like the other fronts of our party work, the ASI is committed to implementing the regional strategy that will continue to build our party globally. This will provide for the first time in history revolutionary cadre organized in a single organization, establishing the advanced detachment on the several continents where Africans are located. And we talk about this regional strategy and how it's implemented globally. And just recently, uh, uh, a month or so ago, we organized uh, the, the Black Power Summit uh, that occurred in Africa and uh, uh, different places uh, in, on the continent of Africa, in the Caribbean, uh, throughout the Americas and in Europe as well. Uh, and, and this Black Power Summits were based on African international principles on the basic strategy for organizing the African revolutionary movement in the African nation that's being implemented concretely by the African People's Socialist Party. I want to say something here because I know that there are uh, uh, African uh, intellectuals and very smart people uh, who uh, uh, don't have as much respect as they should have uh, for the party and what we're doing because uh, much of our work uh, is, is under the leadership of the African working class. And if not uh, specifically somebody who can be identified as the working class uh, is under the leadership of forces who are deeply embedded uh, uh, by uh, within the African working class uh, colony, uh, wherever we are located. And uh, 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 there are people who have come to understand things like, uh, 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 like development uh, that's based on uh, uh, some kind of uh, these uh, programs that come from the imperialists, from the colonizers, the NGOs, uh, uh, some uh, good deal that's going to be given to us by China or by Canada or by Europe, uh, France, or the United States. Uh, and so, uh, and when they come, uh, they are looking to see what kind of program we got sometimes. People who are really interested, people who are really one to what it is that we are projecting, but they cannot understand uh, that we have to do it, that we have to build it. And it's not going to be something that's necessarily built overnight. You just don't come and say, like, uh, we expect now, like, several billion dollars to come from France that's going to help us do this or help us do that. We got to make a revolution and we're fighting on every front. 
So we are in fighting in Africa in the various areas in Africa while we are also fighting in France. And the objective is to have a whole comprehensive struggle for our liberation and for all of us to be willing to submit to the revolutionary project, submit to the party, submit to the leadership of the party that comes in, in various ways. I mean, that leadership, we women, we young people, we old people, et cetera, uh, but they're part of an overall strategy to win our liberation. And there is no other way to get it done. We do have a strategy. We do have an organization. We do have revolutionary theory that informs us, that helps us to understand how this thing got started. We are the only ones with that in the world, uh, for that matter, that has an explanation of the world that is comprehensive, that is complete, that is based in the reality that the capitalist system that dominates the entire world has its origin in colonialism. When Karl Marx made the statement uh, that, that uh, what he called wage slavery, which is capitalism itself, uh, require, in Europe, he said, required as a pedestal slavery pure and simple in the new world, he was talking about a colonial relationship. When he talked about primitive accumulation, about capitalism, uh, that he says uh, that uh, the starting point of this whole capitalist system was turning Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins. And he included what Europe was doing to the rest of the world uh, uh, to create this capitalism. What he was doing was defining colonialism. And colonialism is the, is, the, is the starting point for the development of capitalism. And we are the colonized. And the Europeans rest upon that foundation. That's what we are struggling. So we say uh, here, back to the text, because I only have a few minutes before I turn it over to you. Uh, we are the whirlwind that Garvey predicted would represent his ideological, political, and organizational presence following his US imprisonment in 1927, banishment by deportation to Jamaica, the island of his birth. We are 21st century Garveyites who have the benefit of the lessons provided by his work and experience. This is really important for us to understand that this stuff happens as a consequence of what we do. Ain't gonna be no, no religion, no uh, uh, righteous white organization, no righteous white government, no NGO, no United Nations, no anything else that's going to free us. Our freedom uh, rests uh, in the foundation of the struggle of the most oppressed sector of the African population. And it's our responsibility to bring organization, political clarity, ideolo ideology to uh, that most oppressed sector of the African workers and the poor peasants. This is what has to overturn the social system. This is the thing that will destroy capitalism, destroy imperialism, and bring about for the first time in history a real uh, uh, socialism and real uh, communism uh, that comes as a consequence of the defeat of, uh, of capitalism. They do not uh, coexist in the same uh, political and social space, capitalism and colonial and, 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 uh, and socialism. So uh, that's what it is that we are. And I'm, uh, I'm going to go forward with the political report. I'm saying that my political report adopted at the party's 2017 plenary helps inform our understanding of the significance of the ASI as a concrete expression of African internationalism. It is critical that we review this extensive excerpt, keeping in mind that African internationalism is a theory of practice, a theory with a plan. And I'm quoting now uh, from the political report to the 2017 plenary. Quote, the demands by African people for national liberation is a demand that recognizes the fact that we are colonized, that the African nation as a whole lives under foreign domination. That's everywhere, everywhere. I don't care where you are. Uh, uh, I don't care uh, if you're in Ethiopia. I don't care if you're in Haiti. I don't care if you're in the Fifth Ward in Houston, Texas. The reality is that we are colonized and the African nation as a whole, an African nation that has been forcibly dispersed at gunpoint because you got to Houston and you got to all these other places in Haiti and Jamaica because Europeans attacked Africa. And then at gunpoint threw us on ships and, and, and dispersed us around the world against our will, where we produced tremendous amount of wealth, an unprecedented amount of wealth, uh, that all of it went to the development of Europe at our expense, and that the structures, political and economic structures that were created, though they may have been tweaked uh, over the years, uh, those uh, which have been necessary to maintain this relationship. So uh, we say that, that uh, the African nation as a whole lives under foreign domination. Even if it's neo-colonialism, a new colonialism is, this, is colonialism. We have been waging this concerted struggle for 600 years. 
since the Portuguese invasion that initiated the capture and enslavement of African people in 1415. Because the African nation has been forcibly dispersed throughout the world, the struggle for national liberation has naturally traveled with us as part of the process that gave rise to the capitalist system as a worldwide system. So we can't be kidnapped in Africa and then taken to Haiti and then and, and now the struggle begins. We have brought that same struggle from Africa to Haiti and all the other places. Uh, the struggle for the, the, the struggle for national liberation has traveled with us as part of the process that gave rise to the capitalist system as a worldwide system. The, con the concentrated and subconscious struggle for African national liberation reached its apex under the leadership of Marcus Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League in the first quarter of the 20th century informed by the slogan, Africa for Africans at home and abroad. And this is really important because Garvey was from Jamaica, uh, born in Jamaica, and he would hear uh, the complaints all the time, well, why are you not just fighting for Jamaica? And he says, that's crazy. Why would I be fighting just for Jamaica when the whole of Africa belongs to African people? That's why Africa for Africans at home and abroad, not some so-called uh, uh, American descendants of slave. What's a, a it's a obscenity to even come up with that kind of characterization. It's an obscenity that was imposed on our community from the outside as a neo-colonial attack on the revolutionary unity that's required for the liberation of Africa. I'm not saying all the people who follow that nonsense are, 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 are agents. I'm saying the ones who, who participate at the head of that work for uh, our oppressors. What will a liberated Africa look like? And this is a question that people ask all the time. So let's let's look at that. I'm still reading from the quote, a quote from the, uh, from the uh, 2017 uh, plenary report. Since that time, uh, uh, talking about, you know, uh, the Africa for African Home and Abroad, Garvey, <laughs> since that time, after many setbacks, serious class-based battles within the African community and the establishment of neo-colonialism as a generalized condition for African people, we are forced to look beyond national liberation to the question of the kind of society we are fighting for and to identify the social forces necessary to achieve it. It's really important to say that much of what we are talking about now, defining neocolonialism, is something that happened since the attack on the Garvey movement, which was which was a, a comprehensive uh, struggle of African people to win our liberation. I mean, if you you know if you won't believe that, look at what the 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 speech you can locate the speech made by Kwame Nkrumah on on May twenty uh, May twenty fourth, a nineteen sixty three Addis Ababa. Ethiopia at the founding of the Organization of African Unity, where Nkrumah was warning against the advent of, of neo-colonialism. He said, if we do not unite this Africa now, if we don't destroy these borders and what have and create a single African government, he said that we're going to be fight, fighting the same contradiction that you see happening in Africa today. He predicted that. He said, this will be a consequence of not, of not destroying uh, 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 these borders and he said neocolonialism will reign supreme and it does reign supreme. And in fact, we can target this date um, of May 25th, 1963, the founding of the Organization of African Unity as the advent of a universal, as the advent of a continental wide uh, a neocolonial uh, a process uh, uh, thrust upon Africa and African people, locking us into the, these borders that have been created by the imperialists. White people got together, 1884 and 85 in Berlin, Germany, and carved up Africa and said, "This is what what you know the Portuguese on this and the Germans on this and the British on this, etc. Of us, of our people, our resources, etc. And uh, this happened way back then, uh, but there wasn't that much respected by anybody except the imperialists themselves in terms of what sphere of interest each of them." Uh, control in terms of who was stealing what from Africa, but masses of African people did not respect that. And it was only with the 1963 uh, 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 founding of the Organization of African Unity that the African uh, leaders, so-called leaders, got together. And despite everything that Nkrumah tried to do to prevent it, united with those borders and actually codified, said that an attack on these colonial borders uh, would be an attack on the organization African Unity, and it was something that was prohibited. Uh, so this is this is what we're looking at. And it's really important to understand that they didn't just do this, uh, and they didn't just wake up uh, last night, and this was the reality. This was a struggle that was associated with this this intent, this this effort, and this success, and in, in, in 
dividing Africa, dividing African people, and then locking our, uh, our expectations of success within these narrowly defined territories that they created for us while they control all of Africa. So we are supposed to just be in, involved in trying to free uh, Houston or free Haiti or free Jamaica or while they control the whole African world among themselves and then would criticize us for having the audacity to think of an all African liberation. They criticized Nkrumah, uh, they slandered Nkrumah when he was trying to do that. And of course they, they had, then I say they, I'm talking about the colonizers. I'm talking about the imperialist forces. I'm talking about Europe and America. And, and they, they, they said that Nkrumah just wants to be the leader of all Africa. And they paid off Negroes like Singho out of Senegal. And they even, they, they conned so many other people to work against us. So. I'm gonna just go ahead and read briefly for a, a, a short period of time, uh, Comrade uh, uh, Director Akile, and then turn it over to you. So uh, I, again, I am here on page uh, 35, 36, uh, the first full paragraph. I'm quoting again from the political report uh, to the 2017 plenary. Uh, and, and we say Africans are once free people existing within our own independent economies in Africa have been transformed into commodities, first capital, and producers of capital, first workers, within a social system defined by the relationship between capitalist production and producers resting on a foundation of slavery and colonial domination of peoples and territories. National liberation serves the purpose of freeing Africans from direct foreign domination. However, direct foreign domination is not necessary for vicious life draining economic exploitation, either by foreign or domestic capital. National liberation under the leadership of the African petty bourgeoisie leaves in place a system of exploitation. African toilers, producers, continue to be exploited under the aegis of a domestic flag, which may even be, as in Libya today, a red, black, and green flag. To be victorious, our revolution must take place under the leadership of the African working class. This is the role of the African People's Socialist Party, the advanced detachment, general staff of the African working class. Only the African working class aligned with other toilers, especially the poor peasants, has a stake in destroying the entire system of exploitation and all of its attendant structures, including the artificial borders that exploit Africa, but function as the incubators for the reproduction of the neo-colonial petty bourgeois class as a social force. Only the African working class is compelled to fight for the destruction of class society and the exploitation that produced it. Under the independent revolutionary leadership of the African working class, organized under African internationalist principles, victory will mean the defeat of foreign imperialists and their domestic minions. It will mean that the toilers, the workers and poor peasants in particular, will become the new temporary ruling class, the custodians of the means of production now owned and controlled by capitalists, mostly foreign. Liberation under the leadership of the African internationalist informed workers organized in the African People's Socialist Party will mean the end of economic exploitation. And once the imperialists and African petty bourgeois neocolonists have been crushed, the end of all exploitation. This means that African women who will play fundamental roles in the liberation of our Africa will rise to full stature with all the rights and authority this infers. This means a major assault will be made against all restrictions on the right of women that hide under the flimsy and in most cases false mask of tradition. Nor will African liberation under the leadership of the African working class tolerate social, economic, and political oppression of sectors of the African nation and working class because of spurious bourgeois morality. We condemn the morality and relations that permit Europeans, white people, imperialist corporations, countries, and neo-colonial thugs to exploit our people's lives and resources in Africa and to flaunt laws protecting sovereignty, the environment, and customs with impunity while attacking African people and the working class based on sexual orientation or relations between same gender loving individuals. The liberated African worker state will only oppress the imperialists and the neo-colonists who have surrendered Africa's future to them. We will call on the entire African working class and all African patriots to rise up against those, against all who would divide the nation and the working class based on the false contradictions of sexual identity, ethnic identity, and regional and religious differences. 
the African revolution that liberates and unites Africa and African people under African internationalism, the organized, conscious, and victorious leadership of the African working class will be the death knell of imperialist white power and capitalism as a world economy. It will finally allow for the African workers to take social possess possession of the means of production. Our victory will mean the entire process of production, mining, building, manufacturing, shipping, distribution, et cetera, will occur through workers' councils throughout the production process. This will guarantee safety and creativity throughout. Workers will not approve going into mines like in South Africa that are unsafe in, in, in Virginia. And improvement in the productive process will not be motivated by profit that has no regard for safety and proficiency, I should say West Virginia, otherwise, but by the needs and aspirations of workers as producers and consumers. Additionally, because the state of the African economy smothered by the whims and requirements of imperialist white power has a minimal industrial development, much of the lackluster economic life is centered in the countryside. The African internationalist revolution will be the first major step in the world in resolving the contradictions between the city and countryside. The full rapid development of Africa will require it. We will have to reorganize the African economy destroying all borders into a full-fledged anti-colonial economy. Today's economic activity in Africa is tied to the interests of foreign imperialist explorers. Every bit of food grown or not grown, every factory, every decision to develop a diamond, gold, iron, or bauxite mine instead of production that satisfies our needs is imperialist driven. I mean, you go to Sierra Leone and they're dragging up diamonds for white people that will be going to, you can go to your local mall and get some of the best diamonds in the world of land from Sierra Leone where they're not growing food. There's no major uh, uh, process of growing food for the African masses because it's imperialist driven, not by the needs of our people. It has been the imperialist driven economy that has forced so many African men, women, and children uh, from the artificially created cruel conditions of the countryside into unsanitary and overcrowded cultural crushing cities. The African working class as the transitory ruling class will organize production based on the real needs of the people rather than the contrived profit driven and profit motivated needs of the capitalists. Collective housing, neighborhood councils with the power to solve domestic problems, efficient public transportation, African educational system, illiteracy eradication campaigns, centers for music, cultural development and socializing, birthing programs and socialist care for our elderly, time and centers for reflection, revolutionary rehabilitation programs, barefoot doctors deployed into the community as in China and as in Cuba, places where lovers can go for privacy will become ordinary features of life, overturning the horrible day-to-day -day grind, grind that characterizes our reality today. Even the form of the family will be reorganized under the dictatorship of the African worker state. It will allow adults to enter into agreements of relationships that are free from economic compulsion. Women will be assured economic independence, so financial duress will not be a factor that determines their commitment to a relationship nor enslaves their emotion. The immediate role of the African worker state will be to function as a protector of society against incestuous and exploitative and oppressive relationships and their consequences. African men and women can determine whatever arrangements they contract among themselves with the state functioning as arbiter only until the time when the rule of habit and tradition overturns the rule of the state that becomes unnecessary in human affairs. Our party also has a deep commitment to the well-being of our children, children uh, of our African children, recognizing that under the system of parasitic capitalism, our children live daily trauma. They are demeaned, locked up and gunned down by the colonial police and tormented in the white school system. They are also thrown into mines as children, uh, 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 bringing up uh, uh, resources uh, from coltan uh, in Congo uh, to diamonds uh, uh, in, in Sierra Leone. Uh, this has to end. So we say the APSP, our party, follows in the footsteps of the African Revolution of Haiti, whose rep victory in 1804 produced a progressive constitution that for the first time in history abolished all notion of a so-called illegitimate child and pledged a commitment to the nurturing and protection of every child. The African adage declaring the role of the village in raising a child will be given new life. Uh, women will be freed from the burden as isolated individual primary child care givers. 
the family now becomes a society in a relationship that has the force of law and collective resources of the people that have been liberated from their role as so-called surplus under private ownership within the capitalist system. This means the institution of state funded and administered nurseries and child care collectives that benefit parents and children in a manner that could never happen under colonial capitalist society developed through the commodification of African parents and children. Parents and the community at large will be able to engage in a stress-free, non-competitive relationship with our children. The African internationalist liberation and unification of Africa and Africans worldwide will be the major blow to destroy the entire capitalist system that was an outgrowth of colonialism. It will be the fundamental instrument in the emergence of world socialism providing the defining direction for the world economy. The achievement of African internationalist socialism will be the essential force in the achievement of permanent world peace, easily understood when it is recognized that most wars are fought by states contending with each other and with peoples for profit generating markets and resources. We will replace capitalist competition with socialist cooperation, something not possible before now. I'm gonna stop now, uh, Comrade uh, uh, Director Akile, uh, unless you uh, find another, a need for me to, uh, to proceed. Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman, thank you so much for this incredible study. And I really appreciate you reading this section before we close out, um, well, concluding the section with uh, what would a liberated Africa look like? That was really powerful. Um, we do have questions coming in and I think questions that will require, you know, some, you know, like detailed responses. So we'll wanna go ahead and get into those with that. But first we wanna acknowledge where people are watching from. And I just wanna appreciate uh, those who are tuning in on Facebook or, or YouTube and um, liking and sharing the video. Um, so we have viewers from St. Petersburg, Florida, Huntsville, Alabama, Detroit, Michigan, San Diego, California, Columbia, Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri, Somerville, Massachusetts, Norfolk, Virginia, Kuwait, Gainesville, Florida, Atlanta, Georgia, Orlando, Florida, Battle Creek, Michigan, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Delaware County, Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Richmond, Virginia, Oakland, California, Aurora, Illinois, Occupied Azania, South Africa, Jackson, Tennessee, Durham, North Carolina, Bermuda, Tampa, Florida, Newark, New Jersey, Pinellas Park, Florida, Brighton, UK, Jacksonville, Florida, Cincinnati, Ohio, Lakeland, Florida, Dearborn, Michigan, Nairobi, Kenya, Columbus, Ohio, Irvington, New Jersey, Hempstead, New York, Norfolk, Virginia, Branson, Missouri, Granada, West Indies, Palm Beach, Florida, Jamaica, Dominica, um, English-speaking Caribbean, and Boston, Massachusetts. So. Uhuru, comrades, uh, thank you all for tuning in wherever it is you're located. So now I'm gonna get into some of the first questions uh, that came in and let me get to them. Let's see. <clears throat> so um, this, oh, oh wait, no, that's okay. All right, so this first question we have came from Anthony Carew in Jamaica. He asks, is Pan-African Pan-Africanism contrary to African internationalism, if so, how? And also, what do you think about the increasing amount of us claiming Native American? Um, so the, those are his questions. Well, uh, first of all, yes, uh, there, there's a, a huge the distinction between Pan-Africanism and, and African internationalism. And uh, 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 the Pan-Africanist movement as a, as a real political movement, uh, which was uh, organized uh, under the leadership of W.E. Du Bois and had its first Pan-Africanist Congress in 1919 uh, in Paris, um, was built uh, uh, to uh, contend with and destroy uh, the Garvey movement. It was, an, it, you know, even though today you see people, some of whom claim to be Garveyites and, and otherwise, who uh, talk about Garvey and, and, and as, as a Pan-Africanist, he never was a Pan-Africanist. He was quite clear about that. He knew uh, that Du Bois, uh, worked uh, with the U.S. government and the imperialist powers themselves. Du the Bois has said as much. If you read uh, 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 the book um, uh, Race First uh, by, uh, what's the brother's name who wrote Race First? Uh, but anyway, you can locate it. Uh, so it never was a Pan-Africanist movement. And uh, Garvey was never a Pan-Africanist and never declared or considered themselves a Pan-Africanist, said quite clearly that he was not one. And Du Bois made it clear that he was not a, a, a Garveyite or someone who believed in the, in the philosophy of Garvey. And that uh, not only that, but that he worked with the colonizers. He said that, you know, quite clearly. So uh, uh, they are not the same. And the thing is that, as I mentioned, uh, 
uh, the, the Pan-Africanist uh, Congress uh, uh, and Pan-Africanism uh, as an active uh, organizational uh, political uh, force uh, uh, was created and led initially by the NAACP uh, uh, with, the, with the board uh, as, the, as a, the NAACP National Association for the Advancement of Colored People uh, came out of the United States with the boy uh, as, a, as the leader of that process. So, uh, and, and the boy and the Pan-African has worked with the U.S. government uh, and other forces to destroy the Garvey movement and to destroy the movement for the total uh, liberation and conquest of power for African African people. And as you know, uh, the Garvey movement was distinguished because it didn't just talk about it, it actually created uh, all, uh, as many uh, possible of the, uh, uh, the, the instruments of state power uh, and economic power. Uh, that was what, what uh, it did. And it was a massive movement uh, that brought into its embrace uh, millions of African people. Uh, so that's the thing about, uh, about uh, the Garvey movement. And, uh, uh, and so, and Garvey characterized himself as, a, as an African fundamentalist and the African People's Socialist Party, we characterize ourselves uh, as uh, African internationalists and 21st century Garveyites. So we make a, a, a distinct difference between Pan-Africanism uh, and also uh, because uh, African fundamentalism was based on, on theory. Pan-Africanism is not based on any kind of theory at all. African internationalism was based on theory by the African nation about how we constitute one people and, and uh, et cetera. So uh, what was the other aspect of that question? Was there another aspect of the question, uh, Comrade Anthony raised? Yes, it was about um, what do you think about basically African people claiming to be Native American? More. Well, you know, uh, yeah, a lot of times, uh, <laughs> a, a lot of that is based on uh, some historical fact, if you will. I mean, uh, uh, and, and it's true that uh, for um, a part of the, uh, the presence of African people, certainly in the United States, uh, the only friends when we had a friend was uh, with the native population. Sometimes we were integrated into uh, native uh, populations and actually, you know, became leaders of those populations in the resistance against uh, the uh, the colonizers. I mean, um, yeah, there's a story, a story about the, the Seminoles uh, in, in, uh, based in Florida and what have you, and, and Andrew uh, Jackson, this thug uh, who is on the $20 bill, the other side of which they plan to put Harriet Tubman, a slave owner, an Indian killer, uh, uh, was when he made this war against the, the so-called Indian War, was a war in many instances designed to recapture Africans who had freed ourselves uh, from, uh, from uh, colonial slavery and had escaped and joined with indigenous people. So much of that war was directed at us. And, and so a lot of Africans came to be known as Indians and recognized themselves as Indians. I mean, this, you know, I, I mean, uh, I can't remember for sure, but I think there may have been a time even my grandmother might have considered herself some kind of Indian, but she was black as black. And, and the fact is that, uh, uh, you know, if there had to be a national identity uh, in, on the borders of the United States, then it makes sense that uh, those Africans would assume that identity. So that makes sense to me. The other side, another side of that, of course, is that Africans uh, claim any kind of identity other than African because uh, some Africans did because uh, to be an African was to be just a degraded human being and then as something that we didn't want to be associated with many instances. So we said, you know, uh, my grandmama was, a, was, a, was an Indian or, uh, you know, a folk were Indian so that we didn't have to claim Africa because Africa was such a despised uh, place uh, even in our own imagination because of our relationship to white power. So that happened. Then the other thing that we're looking at is that there's a sector of the uh, of opportunists uh, who uh, claim uh, make this claim about being uh, so-called American Indians or something to that effect uh, as uh, part of a contest uh, with the righteous claims of the indigenous people uh, that uh, that the land that we now know as the Americas was a land that was forcibly expropriated from the indigenous people themselves, and so there's the claim that we were the first here, therefore. You know, this is our land uh, kind of uh, garbage. Uh, the fact is that Africans live under colonial domination because uh, this land that we know of the Americas, not because it was taken from us. Uh, it was because they assault on Africa. And, uh, uh, and we can end up, uh, some of us are innocently and others not so innocently, 
uh, uh, uniting uh, with the oppressors of the indigenous peoples here by claiming the land, which is the one of the most signal, uh, uh, most significant uh, uh, examples uh, of basis for the uh, exploitation of the indigenous people and the theft of their land. And they stuck on these in these uh, 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 concentration camp called reservations. So we end up joining with the with the colonizers and claiming the land that the colonizers also claim. It means that the indigenous people here have to fight the colonizers and then still have to be uh, locked and loaded to fight us uh, as people who would join with the colonizers and denying them uh, their land and their resources. So I hope that was helpful, uh, Comrade uh, Anthony. I know I, I took, um, you know, uh, I, I know I took on many issues while while discussing that, but I hope it was helpful. Uhuru. Uhuru. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to Brother Anthony for the question. We're going to move now to our second question, which comes from Comrade Robin in Orlando, Florida. And um, Comrade Robin um, asks, uh, well, she well, they would love to hear more on Karl Marx being a colonizer, if you could expound on that point. Um, well, my point is that uh, it's not that Karl Marx has uh, some kind of conscious enemy of African people. I'm saying all white people are colonizers. This is not, uh, it's independent of their, of, you know, of their view of themselves. Uh, it's just an objective reality that African people are colonized and that the whole white world exists on the pedestal of our colonization. So it impairs or affects the consciousness of the colonizer when trying to describe reality because the colonizer describes reality from the perch that, that he or she occupies uh, on this pedestal of the oppression of Africans and other people. So this was not uh, meant as a, a, a kind of uh, a statement about you know uh, Karl Marx being engaged in slave training, but he was a colonizer and he had the benefits of colonization. He uh, uh, yeah, I mean, even as he was writing Capital and things like that, his partner and, and, and best comrade, uh, Frederick Engels, uh, who actually uh, actually organized and finished some of the writings that he had done, uh, his father uh, was a capitalist uh, who made much of his money in textiles and stuff like that. And uh, 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 that uh, came from uh, 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 enslaved Africans uh, picking cotton in the Caribbeans and what have you. So, you have Karl Marx talking about the working class and how the industrialized working class overthrowing uh, the industrialized bourgeoisie would uh, bring about socialism, uh, communism, if you will. Uh, but he's able to write about this book, write this book and be fed in many ways by these, these Africans who are picking cotton uh, that his, his friend's father uh, 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 was being enriched by and his friend's father passing on that money to Frederick Engels who passed on money to Karl Marx. And, you know, they, and Marx himself was, uh, you know, and his wife, they're from the uh, aristocracy uh, in Europe. So the point, however, is not so much the, uh, you know, uh, that these were bad people, uh, that these people had bad intentions or anything like that, but just objectively speaking, the relationship we have is one of colonizer and, and colonized. And the colonizers live at the expense of the colonized. And I just think that's important. The, the politic has been so personalized in, in today's world, uh, uh, and certainly that's how it's handed off to us, uh, that we can't see beyond, you know, like personalities and, and, uh, and subjective uh, responses to, uh, to get to what is the objective reality that we are looking at. So the question is not what the intentions of Marx was or whether he had bad intentions or anything like that. They are the colonizers, and white people are the colonizers. And some white people are colonizers. Uh, they are colonialists. Let's say they are they are conscious, active colonizers. There are others who are just colonized by the fact of being born uh, into these circumstances. And some are colonized, and this is important because this takes us away from a uh, uh, racist and anti-racism kind of politic. Because uh, there's no way that you can free a white person from being white. Uh, but a white person can become an anti-colonialist. Once you understand that this is the contradiction that you're dealing with and not the fact that you were born white, uh, something you had no control over and something you can't un do, unlike the woman from the NAACP from somewhere who you know, pretended to be African for such a, a, a period of time, you don't have to do that. You can, you can oppose colonialism. And this is the struggle that we are take, asking white people to do, to be, to be anti colonialist colonizers. So that's the way you break free from that, that trajectory that you know, history has imposed on us. So it's not that Karl Marx uh, thought badly and raped black women or, 
uh, or, or something like that, but he was just born in this place. And Europe itself, uh, uh, the advancement of Europe, the, emer the emergence of capitalism, things like that came as a consequence of, of, of colonialism. And Karl Marx himself has made the statement that uh, when he talked about the development of Europe and capitalism, that, uh, that uh, wage slavery, uh, which is what they call capitalist production or the, or the work that was done by European uh, workers uh, uh, in Europe, he said, raised slavery in Europe required as a pedestal slavery pure and simple in the new world. And so what we're talking about is, is the relationship, the colonialism, the colonial slavery, if you will, uh, 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 is what fed and provided a uh, created a pedestal for all capitalist production uh, uh, in in the world. And so I, I know it was long winded kind of explanation, but I hope it's helpful because it's critical kind of question we're dealing with and not something that you uh, would get from, you know, traditional left wing or even black left leftists who really know how smart they are because they read everything that Marx wrote or they pretend to or something to that effect. Uhuru. Uhuru, so that was comrade Robin. So thank you, Robin. And thank you for in Disney in Disney. In Disney World. <laughs> Disneyland. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh, oh, no. um, yes, and I, I really appreciate that, you know, point about um the colonizer and the colonizer being either colonialist or anti-colonialist. I think that, you know, and being able to um use that point to, like you said, tackle these, you know, question that's like racism and anti-racism, you know, political lines. It's yeah, come right, director. This is uh critical stuff. This is African internationalism. I mean you here, uh, here we'll hear more and more people spouting uh, this stuff, but it's a consequence of the theoretical work that's been done by the party over so many years, and now uh, it becomes essential. You know, we've had all these people who become uh, political elites, uh, uh, you know, talking heads and things like that, because uh, you know they can talk, you know, about you know uh, intersectionality and a whole bunch of other stuff, and sometimes use Marxist phraseology, uh, 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 etc. Uh, but the party has 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 entered into uh, this struggle based on the conditions of African people historically and the role that African African people played in the advent of the social system that now dominates the world, including African people. And this helps us to know how to get out of it. So it's an it's a it's a really important. And and we some of the biggest struggles that we run into are not among ordinary people, ordinary white people, ordinary uh, honest uh, uh, Africans, but among these intellectuals who are Marxist, pseudo-Marxists, and who, and this is why the whole issue of left colonizers. Marx was a colonizer. And I'm not saying that had, uh, that, that was something that consciously informed what he did. I think he tried to do some great work. Lenin tried to do some great work. But you got uh, these left colonizers who define reality from their, their perch in the world. And then you got these left Negroes who uh, borrow the language and because they are in contention for the leadership of African people with the left colonizers. And so they borrow the language and, and, and you know, et cetera, uh, from the left colonizers in contention with them for the leadership of black people, but they do not do really any kind of meaningful, meaningful uh, uh, ideological theoretical development. What they call development in theory is their ability to quote uh, particular uh, white left, uh, um, you know, intellectuals, et cetera, and sometimes Chinese and other intellectuals. And they don't contribute at all to the development of the theory. That's what we're talking about, Uhuru. Uh -huh. We've been talking these guys now for 40 years. Mm -hmm. Uhuru. Uhuru. We call them comment section commies today. <laughs> 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 and then we call some of these others like ideological imperialists. You know, that's what you look at the white left. They're they are ideological imperialists. They demand that our worldview be the same as theirs. That's so anti-Marxist in the first place. I mean, Marx understood dialectics and understood that that couldn't be true. Uh, but they that's the colonizer in them that's coming out that says that the colonizer has to have the same view, the same expression of reality that's experienced by the, those who are uh, the colonizer. We don't play that. Ooh. Thank you, Chairman. You said a mouthful. Mm. Um, <laughs> so we're going to go to our next question, which comes from Comrade Leah in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. 
Uh, Carmed Leia asks, Uhuru Chairman, can you outline how the dictatorship of the African working class would heal the climate emergency slash climate chaos we are experiencing? Yeah, thank you, Carmed Leia. Carmed Leia is an incredible force uh, in Minneapolis. Uh, when I talk about how, how the party, you know, was in Minneapolis, and uh, um, I don't remember if Carmed Leia, no, she wasn't in the party, I don't think, at that time, in the, in the movement at that time, but she's there in Minneapolis, and we have a presence in Minneapolis uh, trying to deal with that. Um, but the, the, the problem is, a problem, is that uh, the, 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 uh, um, the fact is that uh, everything that is done uh, by the capitalists is based on profit, profit motive. You know, the destruction of whole, uh, 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 you know, not just economies, but territories, the destruction of uh, forestry and, and, and other kinds of things, the, the inability of the colonizer uh, to uh, recognize that uh, when you look at, uh, at the environment, when you look at uh, uh, things uh, that, that constitute the environment, the human beings are there too. And it's easy for them to do because Africans are colonizing the very foundation of this system. So they, just, they destroy things like rainforests uh, where we are located and other kinds of stuff as a whole part of the process is just stealing resources. Uh, they dump uh, uh, nuclear waste materials and other kinds of garbage uh, in Africa and other places like that. They contribute to uh, all kinds of things and then profit. Uh, you know, uh, Comrade uh, uh, V.I. Lennon once made the statement that a capitalist would sell you the rope to hang him with. And that's part of what this whole assault on the environment by capitalism is all about. So right now they can make some money off it. They don't give a damn about the environment or anything like that. As long as they can get something that can, can send to Mars or they can send to some other planet that, that, that they may be uh, anticipating inhabiting after they steal all of the loot that they think in terms of mineral resources are located in those places, you know, they don't care anything about the environment. And so for them, profit is the motive force. And that's why it's so crucial, uh, the whole struggle of African and African people and the dictatorship of the African working class, because we start in the rainforest. We start in all of those places that are critical to sustaining life on the planet Earth, with this revolution that we involved in, and we are adamantly opposed to the capitalist system where everything is motivated on profit and nothing is motivated on sustaining life and the people who live here. So the capitalist will sell you the rope to hang himself, uh, he will do that. He will uh, allow uh, the ongoing uh, process of extraction and, 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 you know, to occur. What they call economic development for them is an underdevelopment and assault on the development of everybody else in the world and uh, the assault on the climate uh, 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 itself, on the environment itself. So they don't care about that. They, they don't care about it. And, but, uh, and the socialists, when I say they, I'm not just talking about people who just have bad intentions, even though that plays into it as well. I'm talking about a social system that is driven uh, by profit. It's driven by profit over everything else. I mean, how many years have we been saying and listening to uh, these uh, stories coming from scientists and everybody else, and even sometimes sections of the bourgeoisie that says that this planet is not going to be able to survive this ongoing uh, uh, assault uh, that's being made against it. You know, the how many years have we been saying that? You don't see anything coming uh, from the capitalists that would detect, that would attack this and destroy this and would change their way because profit is everything. And so they can't work for the environment. We can't. And one of the most effective uh, uh, thing that we do for the environment is dethroning uh, the, the colonial capitalist system, getting rid of the colonial capitalists, knocking them out of the box. Uh, that's one of the most effective things that we can do and taking control of the process of production so that it serves human beings as opposed to the profit margin of the bourgeoisie, Uhuru. I hope that was helpful, Comrade Leah. I just want to appreciate the work that I know you're doing in Minneapolis. I think I met you at, if it, if it wasn't ALD, it was probably at uh, a Black is Back coalition mobilization uh, that we had in Washington, D.C., Uhuru. Uhuru, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Comrade Leah. And, you know, I think that this whole question, um, you know, about, you know, the environmental crisis and when we talk about what will a liberated Africa look like, I know, Chairman, you just, you know, talked about it, but, you know, having the, the means of production in our own hands and, you know, being able to resolve this by first and foremost, destroying the system that's killing the environment. And, you know, of course, being able to then solve the problems, um, you know, all the stuff we have to clean up, <laughs> the consequences. Yeah. 
I, I just think that it's really important. I'm, I'm glad Leah, uh, one of the things that makes Leah's <clears throat> participation uh, in our movement uh, a part of the, uh, our Solidarity Fund, the movement, uh, is that, uh, you know, uh, generally speaking, what happens is that uh, the settlers, the colonizers, uh, only uh, recognize a problem when they are confronted with that problem. Uh, I'm not. I'm talking now about just ordinary colonizers. I'm not talking about the bourgeoisie uh, so much, and, uh, and and the colonizers have had the ability to uh, to to talk about uh, the destruction of the trees and the ducks and and all kinds of things. Even as Africans are being murdered and lynched and shot down in the streets all around them here and around the world. Even as uh, people uh, uh, in Afghanistan and all these other places being wiped out. You know, you can have even in South Africa. You got you got environment. I mean, in in places like uh, occupied Palestine, you got white environmentalists, uh, white uh, you know uh, uh, people who uh, are feminists and all of this, and all this rests upon you know uh, our oppression and exploitation. So what what the parties has done is uh, open up a whole new front. Uh, and our solidarity front is one that allows us to deal with this question of uh, ecology uh, uh, that recognizes that human beings are part of the ecology too. It's not just a damn tree. It's, uh, it's the, the fact that African people are being starved and murdered and brutalized and tortured all over this damn place. And that central to ending it all uh, is the liberation of Africa and the colonized peoples of the world. Let's overturn the whole social system. You can't just recognize that the system is bad because uh, trees are dying in your neighborhood or because the duck got oil on it. The fact of the matter is that this system is born rotten to the core, oppressive, uh, exploited, murderous, brutally torturous, kidnappers, you know, rapists. This is the thing that has defined this, this whole system. And the question of ecology, you, you know, we have people who are saying that I, I don't think I'm going to live long enough to die from an environmental disaster. You know what I mean? Under colonialism. This is what we are looking at. And so, uh, so I, I appreciate, uh, you know, uh, Leah, you know, having, you know, joined, you know, the, the party solidarity front and the work that she's doing, because I think that uh, gives a, a more comprehensive approach to the question of uh, environment and ecology that will come from the settlers and the colonizers by themselves. Uhuru. Uhuru, Chairman, that was, oh my God, that was such a profound point, you know, about how human, human beings are part of, you know, ecology, and then you provide this anti-colonial, oh man, that was great, I can't wait to go into that even more, <laughs> Uhuru. All right, so um, we got a couple more minutes left. This next question comes from Comrade Asa um, in Occupied Azania, South Africa. Asa, uh, Uhuru. Uh, yeah. Uhuru, Comrade <laughs> from Africa, Asa. <laughs> so Comrade Asa says, Chairman, I really appreciate you for the wonderful study. And I think that my first question is based on what a liberated Africa will look like. I would like to know if um, uh, if you thought, oh, I'm trying to, um, okay. I would like to know basically what would the arrangements look like between African men and women um, under a liberated Africa? I think African men and women, uh, as I said, you know, in the political report, would enter into relationships that they want that the state only intervenes uh, in these relationships at the point that it represents uh, some kind of threat like incest and, and uh, 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 you know, uh, molestation. But uh, African men and women should be able to enter into the relationship that they want to enter into. And, and that doesn't have anything to, that, that's regardless of, uh, of what has been characterized as how we recognize the form of the, the family under imperialism people can reach these relationships and, and that it's, it's independent of certainly not, not, not um, uh, um, essentially defined by the kind of economic factors that at one time uh, made it uh, economically convenient for women to have a lot of children uh, because of, of what was necessary for the level of, of development of productive forces uh, in a particular place. So you have to have a lot of children so people can go to work and in the fields and things like that. And if you have to have a lot of children and uh, what that means about the form of the family that you might you know, have uh, uh, things uh, uh, like what's it called well, when people are married to more than you know, one person, et cetera, that kind of thing uh, might prevail. But human beings might want that relationship because everything, even though uh, we look at, <clears throat> at uh, when we as, as, as revolutionaries, as materialists, as one who talk about the science of society, 
we recognize that uh, certain forms of the family speak to objective material requirements of society at a particular time. Uh, for example, the, the relationship between men and women is fundamental because it, respi- it, 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 it deals with the, the fact that the species has to uh, continue to be developed. You have to have this relationship in order for the species to, to, to develop. But human beings also have consciousness. And so like you can say the same thing about dogs and cows and, and, and cattle, you know, that they, they are responding to the need for reproduction in order for the ongoing existence of the species. But a thing that's different about humans is an element of consciousness that takes us from the purely uh, 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 biologically driven uh, 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 needs and aspirations. We, we sometimes, humans can say, we're gonna do this because I wanna do it. That's just different from a damn cow, you know, uh, uh, both a cow uh, and a, a, a pretty stupid, now let me take that back. A cow and a human being can end up at McDonald's, you know, uh, but the, the cow ends up, you know, on one side of the counter uh, in the form of a Big Mac and the, and the poorly informed uh, uh, African goes there to, to, to get the Big Mac. One does it through a, a level of consciousness and the other has nothing to do with how that happens. So I'm saying that we as human beings are driven like all other animals uh, to uh, uh, procreation. And that, that is an objective basis, the material basis for why we have sex and have sex with whom it is we have it. And, and so, so that effectively what is part of producing and reproduction of life but we are humans with consciousness. And so it's not purely, uh, uh, it doesn't happen just like that, as we know. Uh, various kinds of laws have been created uh, that to, 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 to determine the submission of women, uh, that says uh, that something about the form of the family in terms of what kind of relationship, but uh, uh, same gender loving people uh, on the ground, on the cover and in the closets and stuff like that, because the laws have been created uh, and, and you have a certain morality emerges uh, from these, uh, this kind of relations of production, but human beings of consciousness. So what will the family look like? It looks like what we want it to look like, what we come into agreement around, agreements that's not, that's not uh, imposed on us by economic uh, uh, desperation, uh, by uh, certain kinds of social uh, uh, con- uh, constraints, uh, uh, et cetera. We're talking about free people. That's what, that's what we are fighting for. And that's, that's what's so critical because Africans are at the base of human society and freedom. And we will define what this looks like uh, in terms of, uh, of, of freedom for the human beings. And it has been something similar to what I'm talking about uh, in, in, in the history of our, of our people, et cetera. So I know it's long-winded, uh, Kermit Asa, uh, but part of making this revolution and part of making this revolution in a way uh, that uh, uh, elevates, allows for the participation of women in the greatest possibility. Uh, so women uh, help are part of the architect of what it is that we're looking for. Uh, 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 that's what will decide what this is going to look like. And we re- knock out all of those restrictions and constraints uh, uh, that's placed on human uh, interaction and development uh, by economics and colonialism and capitalism and all that stuff then you have a free people, we come to our own relationships based on our own terms, this is what it looks like. And it's gonna be a major assault on so many things, <laughs> jealousy and, and other kinds of contradiction that interact, that involves them, themselves in our lives. And, and, and people can know whether a woman can find out whether she's really in love, I really love this guy, or do I have to stay here because I know <laughs> that the rent's gotta be paid, the mortgage's gotta be paid, and somebody got to take care of the children. But if you have a, a, a society where there's child care for every place, and so a woman is not trapped by that, the society itself uh, becomes custodian of the children, where a woman doesn't have to worry that if this man doesn't have a, uh, doesn't, is not here, I won't be able to live. And then a woman is not dumbed down uh, because of that and made subservient to that, uh, that kind of economic reality. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're fighting for. And of course, women are right in the middle of this thing and helping to say what it's going to look like too. And so I, I talked a lot about that comment also, and I know that comrade uh, uh, director Keele is made a little nervous because she's watching the clock. <laughs> Uhuru. I hope that was helpful, comment also. 
Uhuru, thank you, Comrade Asa. And I just really want to again appreciate you, Chairman. And we did have a lot more questions, but we'll have to um, deal with them in the next study. But I just I wanted to say, I think one of the brilliant things I, I appreciate your leadership and just salute the party because when we talk about what a liberated Africa will look like, it's not something that we're waiting to create in the after, but we're dealing with these things right now. And the things that, you know, we have put forward when, even when you were talking about the question of African women and, you know, what our, you know, what it will look like in a liberated Africa. I mean, we're doing that today. We're establishing the foundation for that today. So just, you know, really want to salute the party and your leadership chairman. Um, so, uh, it's, uh, we have about five minutes until announcements. Um, and, uh, I want to just go ahead and turn over to you, chairman, for any, uh, last statements before we, we get there. Well, the last statements before I get there. First of all, I want to appreciate all the party members and who the movement uh, forces and everybody else, you know, who's come on to this and, uh, hoping that among other things, people, uh, really respect the significance of organization, uh, respect the significance of, uh, a revolutionary continuum that uh, organizations have to live long enough and gather experience and political maturity uh, to be successful in theory. Theory, theory is critical. And you need to know what the uh, worldview of anybody uh, that's talking about freedom or any other thing, what is their worldview? Uh, what informs uh, the conclusion that they've come to? And we're an African internationalist and we've made, I believe, incredibly important uh, advance, advances in this area of theory. The other thing I want to say is this, that uh, you know, we've come to hate the, the uh, electoral process. I'm talking about intelligent uh, activist Africans who, and, and normally for good reason, because it's been used as a weapon against us uh, uh, since uh, 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 the destruction of the revolution that uh, allowed for the emergence or elevation of certain sectors of our population as a part of a counterinsurgency a, a war made against us so that people couldn't vote for the ideas of Malcolm, the ideas of the Black Panther Party, the ideas of Jomo <clears throat> or anything like that. The only thing they could vote for is the ideas of the, of the rulers. And so uh, uh, we've broken through that and we're taken into the political terrain. We're denying the ruling class uh, and the African petty bourgeoisie sellout forces uh, to have a monopoly uh, on this discussion with, uh, and on the struggle within the electoral process. It's really important. Uh, it's important because the revolution has to use every available political space that there is in order to advance our struggle and our revolution. I want people to go uh, to look at what's happening in St. Louis at this moment. Comrade Akila, you know you uh, were part of the Saint, of the first uh, uh, revolutionary campaign party uh, where we where we talked about uh, put uh, put reparations on the on the uh, ballot for the first time. You are the reason, and your campaign through the party. Uh, is the is the reason that the that these Negroes and others could talk about reparations uh, in the political arena? Even some people who were running for president, I think uh, uh, Kamala Harris might have had something to say about reparations. But she had that to say, despite the fact that Obama, her guy, came out uh, and and uh, against your campaign. His guy, the president, uh, involving himself in a local election uh, to make sure that the reparations candidate could not win. By the way, uh, I heard uh, uh, my wife and comrade was telling me that Obama came out and said something silly to the effect that the reason uh, he couldn't put reparations forward is because of uh, white resistance. Well, that's some punkish statement as far as I'm concerned. It's a slimy BS kind of statement. If I could talk about reparations, if you could talk about reparations at 20 years old, if uh, other people out here are fighting for reparations, we don't have any kind of power. We're not from, Yale, from, from Harvard or anything like that. We don't have the power of the of the Democratic Party and all of the establishment that would give us a billion dollars around political, and we can talk about and fight for reparations and make it something that the bourgeoisie now is trying to capture and take control of, he could have done it too. So it's nonsense, it's BS, and he's trying to recapture the loyalty of African people so that this issue of reparations can go in the direction that's safe for them. But look at uh, the campaign that we involved in in St. Louis. Look, go to votecolumbai.org, uh, K-A-L-A-M-B-A-Y-I, votecolumbai.org. Go to vote uh, Masimba, M-A-S-I-M-B-I, Masimba, 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 B-A, uh, dot org. Uh, and for these comrades and see what you can do to offer support. This elections are coming up uh, on, on, on the 2nd of this Tuesday. 
And so uh, whatever support you can give, uh, we need that support because this is a part of the struggle we're involved in as significant as any other thing that we're doing. So thank you, Comrade Director. I know I, I, I took more time than you had probably anticipated, but I think it's important for Africans to understand this question. Uhuru. Uhuru Chairman, well, again, I just really want to express my appreciation to you for this study. And I don't think I can salute you enough on this political report um, that we are reviewing. It is just tremendously powerful and it gives us the ability to deepen so our understanding on so many of these questions. Um, but uh, that will bring us to the end of today's study. And I just wanted to let people know that if your question was not answered, that we will be taking it in the first portion of Q&A next Sunday. Uh, so do not fret, we will get to it. Um, the study was brought to you by the Department of Agitation and Propaganda winning the war of ideas. For your revolutionary news and analysis, you can visit theburningspear.com. And for revolutionary radio, dynamic shows, and music by Africans all around the world, tune into Black Power 96.3 FM, broadcasting out of St. Petersburg, Florida, and accessible via the Black Power 96 app for Apple and Android or online at blackpower96.org. The theory of African internationalism is a theory of practice. All the energy of the African People's Socialist Party is focused on the destruction of colonial capitalism. Africans of the world can go to our website, apspohuru.org. It's in the chat comment section of YouTube and Facebook. apspohuru.org to fill out our contact form. And you can order your copy of Chairman Amalia Chatella's latest book, Vanguard, The Advanced Attachment of the African Revolution, which was the political report to the party seventh Congress. You can order that at burningspermarketplace.com as well as a couple of chairman's other titles. Um, <clears throat> so two years ago, the African People's Socialist Party's Southern region declared March 1st to be Mufundi Lake Day. We will be celebrating um, and learning more about our courageous warrior who stood tall and fought for our freedom on uh, tomorrow, March 1st at 6 p.m. Central Time. Join us, his family, activists, friends, and comrades to raise up our fists and salute the life of one of the greatest sons of Africa. Long live Mufundi Lake. Register for this event at tinyurl.com slash Mufundi Lake. Again, that's tinyurl.com slash Mufundi Lake. We are calling on people to, walk, to follow the All African People's Development and Empowerment Project on Facebook or visit developmentforafrica.org for important information and helpful tips in regards to the colonial virus COVID-19. APDEP has recently launched an international telehealth program, a free resource for African people to get our COVID-19 related questions answered by licensed doctors and nurses through Project Black Onk. And you can make your free virtual appointment with one of their professional health care providers by going to developmentforafrica.org slash telehealth. And this month, APDEP's Ask the Doctor series will examine the role of the African intellectual and deepen the theory of African internationalism through a historical and current day analysis of how African scholars, intellectuals, and professionals have and continue to use their skills, which are the birthright of Africa, to further the goals of this parasitic capitalist system. Ask the Doctor host, international director, Dr. Aisha Fields, will be joined by um, the African Socialist International Secretary General Louise Kinshasa and Dr. Matsumela Odom for this important discussion. APDEP invites you to watch this discussion live on Facebook at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern and 6 p.m. I think that's London time at uh, facebook.com slash appdep slash live or join the discussion via Zoom by registering at tinyurl.com slash African Intellectuals 2021. On Saturday and Sunday, April 17th and 18th, 2021, the Uhuru Solidarity Movement will host its annual national convention under the theme, Make Wall Street, Pay Reparations. USM is the mass organization of white people formed by and working under the leadership of the African People's Socialist Party to build the movement for white reparations to African people. The Uhuru Solidarity Movement Convention will feature keynote presentations by Chairman Amalia Chatella and the African People's Solidarity Committee Chairwoman, Penny Hess. For more information, go to uhurusolidarity.org. If you're looking for more opportunities for live political education with Chairman Amalia Chatella, tune in every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern on the Chairman Amalia Chatella's Facebook like page and the Burning Spur TV YouTube page with Chairman's address to the African nation, discussing important topical issues and providing us with an African internationalist analysis. And lastly, to keep up with our movement events, visit theburningspear.com events page and subscribe to our mailing list. Thank you all for tuning in. Make sure you like, oh, 
chairman is raising his hand. I, I don't know. I don't remember if you uh, mentioned uh, March 6th, uh, which is the Black is Back uh, mobilization. Uh, you may have mentioned that, but the Black is Back Coalition uh, is having a, a, a really important uh, webinar conference on, uh, on, 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 on uh, what's it called? Uh, fascism and neoliberalism and the way forward. That's March 6th. Go to blackisbackcoalition.org. And also uh, the blog, Ralph Pointer's blog. Did we mention that? Uh, uh, no, blog, uh, Ralph Pointer's blog talk radio. Uh, oh, yeah. Human, yeah. Um, I'll have to add that back to the announcements. Um, okay. But for information on the March 6th event uh, hosted by the Black is Back Coalition, you can visit uh, blackisbackcoalition.org to register for the March 6th event uh, that Chairman was talking about regarding um, where we'll be discussing things like uh, fascism, neoliberalism, things like that. Mm -hmm. So again, blackisbackcoalition.org uh, to register. And again, that's March 6th. So thank you, Chairman. Um, Huru. All right. So uh, as I was saying, thank you all for tuning in. Make sure you like and subscribe to the Burning Spirit TV on YouTube to catch every episode of the Omali Taught Me 